Hi everyone, I'm Dinesh, I'm the pastor of the Crossing Church, uh, and today uh, at Table Talk we're very uh, pleased to have with us uh, William Taylor, he's the senior pastor of St. Helens Bishopsgate in London. Uh, and our topic for today uh, is expository preaching. Uh, what exactly is expository preaching uh, and why does it matter? Uh, William, welcome, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, it's lovely to be here. Um, maybe we can start by just trying to define what this term means, because expository preaching is bandied about by lots of people. Um, how exactly would you define expository preaching? Thank you. Well, I think some people have put it very helpfully. It's possible to, to use the Bible, but not actually to be teaching it. So it's quite possible to be, have the Bible in the pew and have the Bible in your hands and to be using the Bible to do your teaching, but not actually teaching what the specific author of the passage that you are uh, speaking from intended. So to, uh, to be an exposit, expositor is to expound the text of the Bible with the author's purpose and the author's theology lining up to what the pastoral purpose of the author is in writing this particular part of the Bible so that your preaching comes out of what God the Holy Spirit has inspired the author to write to the particular group that he's that, that he's written it, and so that the application comes out of and carries with it the weight of theology mm. that the author has lined up, mm. rather than me saying, well, I've got a passage of the Bible, I want to use it, and really I want to teach my agenda yes. and, uh, and my sort of systematic theology and the topic that I want to cover today. So we're allowing the author's purpose and the author's direction, the author's theology yes. to drive the sermon towards the author's intended application rather than to an application that I thought might be the application of this passage today. Okay, so that's very helpful because simplistically um, many people would think, look, expository preaching is just preaching through books of the Bible sequentially. So we preach through Ephesians, we preach through Galatians or whatever. Uh, but you're saying that that might not quite be expository preaching, depending on what you're doing with each passage as you preach. Sure, sure. And I think the big question is that I want to be asking always is, you know, why? Why has the author lined up this particular piece of his teaching, this subject, this theme, at this point in the book? Mm. How does it flow out from what comes before? How does it flow into what comes afterwards? Mm. Why has he said it in this way? Mm. And how does what he is saying here mm. fit with what he's saying in the whole book with the major theme that this book tackles? Huh? I'll give you a little example. Yes. See, what should happen is if I've asked the right questions and answered them properly, it should be a little bit like a jigsaw. Yes. That I can see, here's a sentence, and I can see exactly that it fits here, and it fits here because of what comes before it and what comes after it and how it fits with the... the and if there's a piece of the jigsaw that I haven't quite worked out where it fits, yes. I haven't properly understood what the author is doing. Yeah. I mean, here's a really simple one, the call of Levi. Mm. The call of Levi in Luke's Gospel comes straight after the healing of the paralytic. Mm. What is the point of the healing of the paralytic? Mm. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. I tell you, take up your mat and walk. Mm. So what Jesus is doing in the, calling the, para the healing of the paralytic in Luke uh, chapter 5 mm. is demonstrating to the assembled Pharisees and teachers of the law who come from all over Israel into this synagogue, mm. that he has all authority on the earth to forgive sins. What happens immediately he leaves the synagogue? There's Levi, mm. an arch sinner. Mm. And what does he say? Follow me. Mm. And the teachers and the rulers and the Pharisees are horrified. I call it the party that rocked the religious. <laughs> because Levi then summons all sorts of other sinners. But actually when you look at it in its context, mm. um, if Jesus is saying he's got authority on the earth to forgive sins... Mm. Of course he goes out of the synagogue and gives a kind of visual aid of what he's just shown in the synagogue. He's come to summon sinners. Follow me to Levi is the obvious thing. You can see why it fits, where it fits. Mm. Now, the very next passage, new wine, new wineskins. There are all the author authorities, the powerful leaders, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Uh, there he has all authority on earth to forgive sins. There is Levi summoned. Mm. They grumble, they mutter, they murmur. Next passage new wine, new wineskins. Mm. And do, do you see the whole thing's fitting together? Mm. Now, that matters because 
then the theology of the author, the New Testament authors, are systematicians, yeah. they are theologians, and they've lined up their theology to make a pastoral point. Mm. And the theology of the author is driving your preaching, mm. which means that your preaching carries real weight, mm. because it's not gone off on a tangent to the theology of the author. Mm. And, and that means that, I mean, it sounds like a lot of preparation goes... Uh, into your study and, and trying to figure out what this whole book is about what's the author's purpose in, in Luke's gospel for example sure. before you even preach the individual passages that's right yeah. yes that's right I, I think it's easy then for a young preacher to panic yes oh, I'm never going to be able to do this yes um, and I, I think we need to realise that actually God is looking for us to peak as a preacher yes. perhaps when we're between Shall we say 55 and 70? That gives me another four or five years to yes. be working on it. Okay. Um, and to say, yes, well, it, it's worth thinking about starting to preach whole books of the Bible, yeah. getting familiar with them. First time through, you'll just be feeling your way around the landscape. Mm. You'll get help because you'll listen to other people who spoke on it. You'll read a commentary or two, mm. but you'll be reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. Mm. Once you've got familiar with the landscape, second time through, or maybe you'll take a little section of it and say, well, I know where it fits and why it fits. Mm. And now, and, and gradually you're building and building and building until you've got a much clearer idea of why Luke is saying what he says, how he says it, who he's saying it to, where it's going. Mm. And, and don't panic and think you have to be, you know, the, 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 the rounded preacher when you're 28. Yes, yes. Uh, I think that's really important. Yeah. And, and, and what you're saying is also very helpful because you're saying, look, an expositor has the Bible as the master, and where it's servant. We're trying to figure out what is the author saying, and then we're trying to preach that message. Whereas most of the time, you you have uh, you know the preacher trying to impose his message or his framework, or mm. use the Bible as a launching pad. That's right, and that will always ultimately be boring, mm. because the congregation will always get used to receiving the preacher's framework. Yes. And it will always begin to make the congregation proud yes. because they will think they have mastered the scriptures rather than having the scriptures master them. Mm. So ultimately, framework preaching is boring, which yes. is why framework preachers have to move congregations so frequently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's weak because you hear a it man's is. voice it is. It rather is. than it God's. Is. It is, yeah, that's right. So um, somebody said to me once... Um, there's a difference between help, I've got to say something about God, mm. and listen, God has given me something to say. Yes. And I want to be coming to the text, not thinking, oh, what systematic idea of mine from my theological college does this text raise, and giving my talk on that systematic point yeah. with a few illustrations and moving stories packed in. Mm. But I want God's agenda and God's authority and the theology that God has lined up here to make this point with all its weight and its application mm. to be driving the preaching. And somebody who's been under expository preaching will find those other sorts of preaching ultimately pretty dull mm. and weightless. Mm. Mm. And often frustrating and trying to figure out, but is that really what the passage is saying? That's right. That's yeah. right. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about... Um, other types of preaching out there. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is expository preaching really is what preaching should be uh, because you don't want to be imposing your, your message. You want to listen to what God has to say uh, as he's uh, inspired these different authors in the Bible. So is expository preaching essential or just a, a good to have? I think it is the essential bread and butter of any congregation. Mm. So from time to time, you might want to do something topical. Yeah. But if you are going to do something topical, do it from passages or a section of the book of the Bible where you have worked out that that really is the topic mm. that the author is seeking to address. Mm. And then use, again, the weight of the theology of the author at that particular point in Scripture to drive your application. Mm. So I've got nothing against topical preaching. Mm. But what I think we need to be nervous of is somebody who says... I'm going to take this topic or that topic or the other topic mm. and then go scattering off all over the Bible mm. to try and put together my framework of how to handle this topic. Mm. Why not go to the Bible where the topic is? If, it, if it's a topic that needs covering, yes. it'll be in the Bible. Yes. If it's not in the Bible, it's not a topic that needs covering. Yes. So, yes. Uh, so for example, if you're going to preach a series on the Holy Spirit, uh, you might go and look at you know, uh, six or seven or ten passages uh, where um, the Spirit's work is 
clearly lay down the Bible mm. and preach mm. through those passages. Yeah, I might, might well do that. Yeah. I might just go to John 14 yeah. and 15 and, yeah. do it, and just do it from there. You know, say, yeah. what is John's theology of the Spirit? Yeah. One of the best si- series I can remember on the theology of the Spirit, on, on teaching on the Spirit, was done by Dick Lucas, who just said, we're going to go through Galatians. Mm. We're going to find out everything that Paul has to say about yeah. the work of the, the Spirit in Galatians. It was a terrific series because we had, again, we had the theology and the pastoral practical application of Paul being lined up rather than me just picking all sorts of ideas. Mm. It seems to me there's a, there's a slight dichotomy. A lot of people have a high view of Scripture, but at the same time when they come to their actual preaching, mm. their practice of preaching, uh, you know, whether it's framework or they're launching off the text and they're not really expositors, that actually shows that in practice they have a low doctrine of Scripture. <laughs> uh, what, what do you think about that? <laughs> what do I think about that? Well... I wouldn't want to comment too much on what other people are doing on that regard. Very interestingly, um, I, I've just had been talking to a student who has started reading the Bible one-to-one mm. with a non-Christian mm. friend of hers. And um, she said, well, where shall I start? I think I'll start in Mark's Gospel, and I think I'll teach this friend about um, the identity of Jesus. And then I think I'll teach the friend about the mission of Jesus, so I'll start in, I can't remember what it was, Mark two or four or something like that mm. and then I'll go to Mark 10 and, um, and, 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 and what do you think about that? And I, I, I said well do you think perhaps Mark might have written his gospel um, the, the way he wrote it so that he could instruct us in a particular way about the identity of Jesus and the, so why are you dotting around Mark's gospel why don't mm. you follow the authoritative pattern of the scripture why do you feel that you need to you need to rearrange Mark's gospel effectively. After all, if it was dictated by Peter to Mark, here you have the Apostle Peter's um, equivalent of a um, evangelistic tract. Yes. Um, so why do I suddenly need to feel I need to rip bits out of here, bits that rearrange it all, put it back together again, so my friend can understand when God the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Peter to dictate to Mark after, at the end of his apostolic ministry, this particular, um, do you see what I mean? So, yeah. And it does display a sort of slight lack of, I agree, a slight lack of confidence yeah. in, in, in God to work through his word the way he's ordered it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think looking around the world, I mean, one of the things that's all a buzz now in the last few years is um, churches want to be reformed, uh, which is mm-hmm. a great thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, I think having a reformed theology that drives uh, what you're preaching, but also being an expositor. I mean, those two things working together. Mm. I mean, that seems to be the healthy balance that, that, that we need. Yes, I, I, I think, again, I want to be cautious. Of, of course, I want to be reformed, mm. but I want to be reformed under Scripture, mm. not reformed necessarily under my confessional statement. Yes. And if my confessional statement is a confessional statement put together by human beings, even if it's put together by human beings from the scriptures, mm. inevitably it won't necessarily have the same weighting mm. or the same emphasis. Very often those confessional statements are put together in a time of particular dispute. Yes. And therefore often they tie together ends and want to kind of tighten down things. Yes. But when you get to the Bible, aren't nearly so tight and not so carefully tied off. Yes. And there is a danger at that point, I think, that we start to rely over heavily on my human reason. Mm. That if scripture doesn't tie off an end Mm. tightly, Mm. then I'm not sure I'm at liberty to tie off an end tightly. And part of the value of expository preaching is I will pick up this system that may have been written in the 17th century Mm. or or may have been written in the 4th century, Mm. but I will pick up this confessional statement Mm. and say, well what do the scriptures have to say about this? Yes. So that my framework is always being corrected yeah. and having edges knocked off it and, and, and so forth. And you know, am I emphasising something which actually the Bible writers don't emphasise very heavily mm. um, because it had to be emphasised in the 4th century for a particular uh, reason? For a particular reason. Mm. Yeah. Now one, one criticism is that expository preaching uh, only serves the educated elite. Uh, who can concentrate and you know who who can read and, and all the rest of it, um, and it actually will not serve uh, mass congregations where people are, are vastly different. Mm. Uh, what, what would you say to that? 
Well, I think I would say, as nicely as I could, that um, Mark's Gospel seemed to serve um, many people from all walks of life mm. over many centuries mm. for the advance of the Gospel. Mm. So if expository preaching appears only to serve an educated elite, mm. maybe it's the fault of the expository preacher mm. rather than the fault of expository preaching. Yes. Now, let me say at this point, what happens, I think, with some young preachers, um, and indeed uh, you know, some of us old, old codgers, is um, that we can be so excited about the method mm. of expository preaching mm. that we show our congregation far more working mm. than we ought to. Mm. And there's an awful lot that needs to be left in the study. Mm. And as a rule of thumb, mm. I will try in any one sermon only to show one piece of you know, thorough working. Mm. Um, I want everybody to know that everything I'm saying has come out of the text. Yes. But I don't want to tell them every piece of exegetical method I've used mm. all, all the time, right the way along the way. Yes. And the trouble is, when you get hold of expository preaching, usually you've heard somebody doing it and you've begun to see, oh yeah, he's done this, he's done this, he's done this, he's done this, he's done this. Mm. And you feel in every sermon you have to bring in all your method. Yes. Actually, you will notice from the people who really know what they're doing, yeah. is usually over a sermon series of ten sermons, they might show you ten different aspects of their working, yes. but they will only put a little bit in each one. Mm. So often it's the fault of the preacher, but to say that expository preaching is only for the educated is it, it, it cannot be right, given mm. that expository preaching is expanding the word of the apostles, mm. and the word of the apostles is actually what took the gospel to the ends of the earth, to all different types of people. Yeah. Thank you very much, William. Thank you. It's a great pleasure.